hello and welcome to this video in this video I'm going to talk about subgroups of R plus or additive subgroups of R okay so let us first uh, recall some examples of subgroups there are a lot of subgroups of R for example Q the set of rational numbers is a subgroup of R Z is a subgroup. N is not a subgroup because it's not stable under uh, the operation of taking opposites. AZ, which is the set of multiples of A for a certain number A in R. This is also a subgroup. Okay. So the sum of two elements of AZ is in AZ and the inverse or the opposite of AZ is in AZ, of an element in AZ is in AZ. Okay, and we can combine subgroups. The sum of two subgroups is also a subgroup. So we can take AZ plus BZ or AZ plus BZ plus CZ. The, all these are subgroups of R plus. We can take Q plus AZ. Of course, if A is uh, rational, this is just Q. But if A is irrational, this is something new, right? And so on. Now, I'm going to state a theorem, uh, which in some sense classifies the subgroups of R plus into two categories. Okay. If G is a subgroup, a subgroup of R plus, then either G is of the form AZ for some A in R, or G is dense in R. For example, Q is dense in R. And you shall give other examples, actually, other than Q. Okay. So, in case A, G is closed. Because, like, the, the, we proved that Z is closed. But AZ is just a copy of Z, if you like. So, it's closed and discrete. Which means that all points of G are isolated. Like, so, the case AZ is just like Z. Okay, so let us prove this. If G is a subgroup of R plus, okay, we have a trivial case. If G is the trivial group, which happens actually, because there are two trivial groups, the zero, the, the, the zero group, and the R, the R group itself, are, these are two trivial cases, but we are not interested in them. So we eliminate the case, if G is the trivial group, then of course G is of the form 0z, right? So it's not interesting. So we assume now that G contains an element different from 0. Now, since G is a group, then G contains positive numbers and as well as negative numbers. Why? Because A is stable under the operation of taking the opposite. So if A is in G, then minus A is in G. Now, among A and minus A, one is positive, the other is negative, right? So consider the positive elements of G and call it G plus. Okay, we exclude zero. Now, G plus is not a group. It's not a subgroup of R plus, right? Because it's not stable under the operation of taking the opposite. And consider the infimum of G plus, the infimum of G plus. By the way, I used to say infimum, but it's actually infimum. So, since all the elements of G plus are bigger than zero, then A, the infimum, is greater or equal than zero. So we, just, so we have two cases. The case where A is strictly positive and the case where A is strictly zero. The case where A is strictly positive will give us the first case. And the case A equals zero will give us the second case. Right? Okay. So suppose that the infimum is positive. We first claim that this A actually belongs to G. How do we know that? We reason by contradiction. Suppose A is not in G. Now, we first observe that 2A is bigger than A, right? Because A is positive. And A 
is the greatest lower bound of G plus. So anything greater is not a lower bound. So 2A is not a lower bound of G plus. This is something that we used already, actually. So what does it mean that 2A is not a lower bound of G plus? It means that some element of G plus is not greater or equal than 2A. So it's less than 2A. Now, in principle, B is bigger or equal than A. But since A is not in G, B cannot be equal to A because B is in G and, and G plus is in G, but A is not in G. So we have strict inequality. And now we repeat this argument another time. B is bigger than A. So B is not a lower bound of G plus. So there exists a third element, C, which is between A and B. And once again, C is different from A because A is not in G and C is in G. Okay, now, observe that B minus C, because B is less than 2A, once we subtract C, we get B minus C less than 2A minus C. Now, I claim that 2A minus C is less than A. Why? Because A is less than C. So, uh, if we... If we subtract C and add A, we get this. So A minus C plus A is less than A. Right. Okay. So what do we have now? We have B minus C less, less strictly than 2A minus C, and 2A minus C less than A. So B minus C is less than A. And now we get a contradiction, because B and C are by construction elements of G. And since G is a group, the difference of two elements is still inside the group. So B minus C is an element of G, first thing. But because B is greater than C, the difference is positive. Okay, so B minus C actually belongs to G plus. Uh, so it so and from the one hand, it should be bigger than, since, since it's an element of G+, plus, it should be greater or equal than the lower bound, than the, than the infinimum of G, which is A. So it should have B minus C bigger or equal than A. But by construction, B minus C is strictly less than A. And this is a contradiction. So the claim is proved. So this element A, which is the infimum, if it's positive, then necessarily it belongs to G. Of course, if it's zero, it belongs to G because any subgroup contains zero. Okay, so if A is in, is in G, then any, and G is a group, then any multiple of A is in G. So A minus A is in G, 2A is in G, minus 2A is in G. So all multiples, positive or negative, of A are in G. So the group AZ is contained in G. So I have to prove now the reverse inclusion. So take an element, an arbitrary element, small g in capital G. I want to prove that small g is an AZ. It's of the form NA. So take N to be the floor function of G over A. Okay, so what do we have now? G is in capital G, and A is in capital G. So NA is in capital G. The difference of two elements of G is in G. So G minus NA is in capital G, is in the group. On the other hand, by the definition or by a property of the floor function or that we already used several times, the floor function of a number is between this number minus one and the number itself. We already observed this by definition. So what do you have now? If n is less or equal than g over a, then n a is less or equal than g, so g minus n a is bigger or equal than zero. So this inequality here gives us that g minus a is bigger or equal than zero. Now, if I factor by a, I get a times g over a minus n. Now, g minus g over a minus n is less than 1 by this inequality. So when I multiply by a, which is positive, I get that this quantity is less than a. Uh, so, what do we, so what do we have to conclude, actually? We have to conclude that g minus n a is 0. Why? 
because if g minus an a was not zero okay then it would be a strictly positive element in g so it, it would be an element of g plus and therefore it would be greater than the lower bound which is a and this is a contradiction okay so I have to conclude that G minus NA is zero and therefore G equal NA and therefore G belongs to AZ. So we have a double inclusion and therefore in this case G is exactly of the form AZ. <clears throat> Second case A equals zero. Now we'll prove that G is dense. So we'll follow the, the familiar procedure proposition 1.6. Take an element x in R and a positive number epsilon. Okay? I will prove that the interval x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon meets the group G. Okay? Or otherwise stated, there is an element y in G whose distance to x is less than epsilon. Same thing. So because this means that y is in the neighborhood of x, x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon. Same thing. <coughs> okay. Now, since the infimum is zero and epsilon is strictly bigger than the infimum, then by a property of the, so it means that epsilon is not a lower bound of G plus, right? So we, we, it means that we can find an element in G plus less than epsilon, right? And now we take y to be n times g, where n is the floor function of x over g. Okay, I will prove that y satisfies this inequality. And we are done. Okay, first of all, y, which is a multiple of g, belongs to g, because g, capital G is a, is a group. Okay. And by definition, of the floor function, the floor function is between the number minus one and the number itself. Okay? So, it means two things. If we multiply by g, we get what? We get x minus g less than ng less or equal than x. Okay? And therefore, x minus ng is bigger or equal than zero. So, this inequality gives me x minus ng bigger than zero. And this inequality gives me x minus ng less than g. So subtract ng and add g, right? And since by construction g is less than epsilon, we get what? We get x minus y, which is x minus ng, is less than g less than epsilon. So this proves. And x minus y is bigger or equal than zero, which is of course bigger than minus epsilon. Okay, so we have proved actually a better estimate. So we, prove, we we found an element in G to the right of X. So we prove that any neighborhood of X meets G at certain point Y. And therefore we conclude as usual. So R is contained in G bar and therefore G bar equal R. So G is dense in this case. Okay, so this concludes the proof of this main theorem about subgroups of R+. Plus. So let us illustrate this uh, to prove a density result. The group Z plus pi Z is dense in R. Why? How do I know that? It's enough to prove that the first alternative in the theorem cannot hold. So we reason by contradiction. Suppose that z plus pi z is discrete, so it's of the form az, okay? Now, consider the number 1. 1 can be written as 1 plus 0 times pi. So 1 actually belongs to z plus pi z, right? Which is by assumption, by our assumption, is equal to az. So 1 is in, belongs to az, which means that 1 is of the form a times m for some integer m. So this implies that A is a rational number. On the other hand, if you take pi, pi can be written as 0 plus pi times 1. So pi is in z plus pi z, which is by our assumption is az. So pi is of the form a n for some integer n. But since a is rational, a n is rational, so pi is rational. But pi is irrational, as you know. 
So mass, so we re we reached a contradiction. So it means that the, no matter what, how do you, do you choose A, the first alternative of the theorem cannot hold. Therefore, we have to conclude that Z plus pi Z is a dense subgroup of R plus. And more generally, if you if you if you take two real numbers whose ratio is irrational, in this case we say that the two numbers are rationally independent, then a1z plus a2z is also dense enough. Same reasoning. Try to write the proof. Okay. And now we can solve an exercise, which is which uh, is in your book actually. We have to prove that the set of elements of the form cosine n, when n is an integer, is dense in minus 1. Now, first observe that we can replace n by z. Why? Because cosine is even. Okay. So, if you write this as union of two things, cosine n, n and n, or z plus, and co union cosine n, n is in, in minus, and z minus, these two coincide. So, we can replace n by z, doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. How do I prove the density? One way is to prove that any element in minus one one is the limit of a sequence in A. Right? So this is the strategy of proposition one point six that we illustrated several times. Okay. Now we know that any number between minus one and one is the cosine of something, right? Because the cosine is surjective from r to minus one, right? So choose one doesn't matter actually. Choose one element. You can you can choose it in zero pi if you like. In uh, sorry, in minus uh, yeah, you can choose it in zero pi if you like, but doesn't matter. So choose a number whose cosine theta whose cosine is x. Okay. Now we know that z plus two pi z is dense in r because two pi over one is irrational. So I can approximate theta by a sequence in z plus 2 pi z that I call theta n. Now, theta n, any element in z plus 2 pi z can be written as an element in z plus 2 pi times another element in z. So I can write my sequence theta n as alpha n plus 2 pi beta n, where a alpha n and beta n are integers, right? So alpha n plus 2 pi beta n converges to theta. Since the cosine function is continuous, then cosine theta n converges to cosine theta, which is x. But since cosine, the cosine is 2 pi periodic, then the cosine of theta n is the cosine of alpha n plus 2 pi beta n, and beta n is an integer. So by periodicity, this is just the cosine of alpha n. Right? And we are done. Now, cosine alpha n is a sequence of A because it's cosine of an integer. So cosine alpha n belongs to capital A. And it converges to X. And that's it. We are done. Okay, so this concludes the first appendix to chapter 1 about subgroups of R+. Plus. Uh, I have two other appendices that uh, I will talk about next time. And we, you can consider that we, we, are, we almost finished chapter one. Okay, thank you for your attention.